Hello, and thanks so much for tuning in. We've got some really important information. We're going to show you how to uh, image coronary arteries step by step. We're going to see how to use uh, high probe frequencies, positioning the patient, and the use of the transverse plane to improve your imaging of coronary arteries. You're going to also see how you can train yourself to see things moving really quickly. And remember, color Doppler gives you the diagnosis. Okay, step by step, step one, change to a high frequency probe and set the depth to 10 centimeters. If you can do less, that would be great. So the shallow depth improves the frame rate and beam focus. Um, and this, although this cuts off structures below the aorta, but we really don't need to see those structures. Uh, remember, the coronaries must be big enough to uh, measure, so keep that depth uh, shallow. Okay, step two, position the patient all the way on the left side. Position the left arm up with the elbow bent. Check to be sure that the pectoral muscles have become as flat as possible. If not, reposition that left arm until you can feel that the pectoral muscles are all the way flat. If this doesn't work, turn the patient even farther to the left until they're almost falling over. And remember to keep the shoulders square. We don't want the chest sticking out or sticking in. Little kids sometimes like to stick out their chests. Step three, place the transducer in the third intercostal space and hold the probe in a transverse plane, just like CT would do. Um, and be sure to apply the gel to the entire intercostal space all the way from the sternum to the armpit. Move the probe all the way along the third intercostal space. Sometimes it's all the way out to the armpit uh, to look for the best uh, window. And remember, it's not short axis. You're not going to be able to see coronaries well in short axis. So here is a uh, short axis view. And we can see just a little bit of the origin. Uh, but I'm looking for anything that's uh, suspicious. And the first thing that I see is that the non-coronary cusp is uh, a little bit too big. And I'm also seeing that the uh, uh, right coronary cusp and the left coronary cusp, there's a little bit of a blur here. Uh, and then again, I'm always checking for aortic regurg regurgitation, which can sometimes mimic uh, coronary artery uh, osteostenosis. Okay, it takes a lot of pressure to, um, to do this. And the reason is we want to compress the pec pectoral muscles and the skin. And we need to get as close to the coronaries as possible, and even a few millimeters can help. Uh, remember to move the skin around. Pulling the skin taut can further avoid unnecessary attenuation of the ultrasound beam. And don't be afraid to push the edge of the probe into the bone. This can provide as a fulcrum uh, where you can uh, change your angulation. Okay, step five, wait. Remember, you have to observe at least three respiratory cycles. A better window may open up during expiration, but I do want you to avoid help, held expiration if possible. Just ask the patient not to take deep breaths. Uh, observe how the heart is moving. There's both rotation, forward movement, side lateral movement, and uh, you can also see uh, the superior inferior movement uh, from respiration. So the position of the heart is constantly changing. Remember, things are moving really fast, so give yourself a chance to see brief images. Be patient. A few, a few minutes can make a big difference. Okay, step six, try to show the longest segment of the left main coronary artery and the left anterior descending as possible. Okay, not short axis, transverse above the aortic valve. Move the aorta off to the side so the beam is perpendicular to the coronaries. Look for the bloom artifact when the beam is at 90 degrees. This really helps me to see 
uh, that I'm looking at something real. Anything unusual should raise suspicion. A little circle, a bump, um, a blur, uh, a bright echo. Um, and we want to avoid false or fake coronaries. These things come from echo dropout, reverberation, the left atrial appendage. So let's have a look and see what some false coronaries look like. So here we can see um, a short axis and I'm trying to measure the right coronary artery here. Maybe it plugs in here. This is not a coronary artery and this is really just part of a coronary artery. So it, it's very unlikely you would get two left main coronary arteries or a separate origin of the left anterior descending. So this is obviously, I have to dismiss this. I see these all the time, um, constantly trying to find these false coronaries so I don't uh, get fooled. So here we can see what I feel is a real coronary artery. Uh, when the beam is at 90 degrees, it creates this bloom artifact. Uh, these, this echo is much stronger than anything else on the screen. Another bloom artifact here. That helps me to know that this is a real coronary artery. And again, we're seeing some bright echoes along the left anterior descending. But I am seeing something suspicious. There's an awfully wide split here between the circumflex and the left anterior descending. So the uh, bifurcation uh, is uh, really, really wide. I'm also seeing a little bit of echo dropout here and a little bit of a circle. So I've seen the, the large uh, non-coronary cusp. Um, I've seen this wide bifurcation. I'm really starting to get suspicious about this uh, seven-year-old girl who complains of chest pain uh, while uh, after running more than two miles. So now that we know we can see a real coronary artery, it's time to do the color Doppler. We're gonna lower the scale to 30 centimeters per second. Um, we're gonna try different scale and gain settings. And we're gonna remember that even mild pulmonary or, a or aortic regurgitation can be confusing. So uh, my first clue is that the left main coronary artery and the LAD are just too easy to image. That raises a red flag right away. And I'm looking for a quick red flash just above the origin of the left main coronary artery. Things are moving really fast. So give yourself some time to observe this very brief, just a flash uh, uh, movement and color. So, now I know that, yes, we can see color in the uh, coronary, and that's really important. Some patients, you can't see color flow uh, in the coronaries, and I, I just can't trust it. But in this case, I'm seeing, not only am I seeing coronary blood flow, but I'm, it's really uh, coming in just too easy. I'm getting some bloom here. Um, seeing a lot at this very wide bifurcation. The whole thing is making me very, very suspicious. Okay, so again, we see this large non-coronary cusp. We can see the origin, but I'm also seeing a little bit of thickening, kind of a bright echo here. So let's look out over this side. Yeah, I can see this uh, small amount of aortic regurgitation but there's something else. There's a little flash right there. That is very suspicious to me. Um, and remember, I have to be uh, careful not to confuse that with pulmonary regurgitation. Okay, again, I'm seeing coronary blood flow that's just a little bit too easy uh, to image. But I also want you to notice the respiratory cycle. So this, uh, the heart is moving, the lungs are moving. Uh, so I have to wait for things to jump into my uh, plane. Okay, now I'm above the aortic valve now. Um, I'm looking at this little bloom artifact here, sick sticking out 
and now I have to look over here and I can see just for one frame when the heart is being moved by the lungs uh, the uh, flow pops in so this is what I this is the most important part of this talk is to be able to find this little bit of red color flow here again I want you to see that the lungs up here are pushing the heart into the place where I can see it. So it's a little bit of luck sitting there hoping that the heart will pop into, uh, into the right plane. So being patient and observing both of these uh, movements here, see the heart is being pushed over with each resp respiration but the aorta is also jumping up and down here. So again, uh, there is this one little uh, uh, red flash here. There's also a little twinkle over here, and we get these all the time. Uh, it took us a long time to learn that these twinkles pretty much should be ignored. So now that you've found the obstruction, it's time to zoom in and split the screen. Um, this, uh, all these coronaries have a slit-like orifice and that creates some turbulence which can enhance the 2D image and the color Doppler. So this coronary may be very, very small or hyper, hypoplastic. And remember, it's not the course that you would usually see with a coronary artery. It's a diagonal course. So this shows coronary osteostenosis, and this is severe, uh, less than a millimeter here. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that in girls, it's harder to image. Uh, I really couldn't go back and get this image, but uh, this guy here, yes, I could, I could reproduce this. But uh, we have a slit-like orifice, and it's creating this strong color Doppler signal as the blood gets uh, squished into this very tiny uh, hypoplastic uh, right coronary artery that arises from the left coronary cusp. Remember, this is not short axis. This is a transverse plane, just the way they would do it on CT. So again, that this the blood flowing by here creates a little bit of a bloom artifact and enhances the color Okay, step nine, it's easy to make things look normal. So we need to confirm our diagnosis in a longitudinal plane of the ascending aorta. And just in my experience, girls have smaller coronary arteries and they're just much more difficult to image. They're more likely to be symptomatic and they're they more often have very serious obstructions like the example I'm showing you here and it, they're more likely to have very complicated disease, very difficult surgeries. So here we see the uh, right coronary cusp and up here we can confirm that the uh, artery is traveling through the wall of the aorta. So this is how I want to confirm that what I'm seeing, I've seen it in two planes now, um, very high up, not at the level of the uh, aortic valve. So once again, here's our little telltale sign. And over here, we're really just seeing, just for a second, a bright echo, and just for a second, the narrow coronary uh, um, ostium with the slit-like orifice and the hypoplastic segment. So we have to look for things that are moving very, very quickly. Conclusion, dig in, move the skin around, frequently reposition the patient. Be aware of both the cardiac and the respiratory cycle. They're both moving the heart. Um, and we're waiting for those to help us, to help move, move the heart into a position where the sound waves will bounce off. Remember, you have to train yourself to see things moving very quickly. 
Um, it's, it's quite a skill and uh, it could take 500 or 1,000 repetitions until you get to be really good at it. And remember to be patient. This can't be done quickly. I'm waiting for the heart to jump into the right position to uh, show me um, the pathology. And be sure to check out what you must know about congenital coronary osteostenosis. The incidence of it and the mortality coming soon. You can see me on Twitter at, at jlayton 231 or visit our website at www.echovascular.com. Thank you so much for paying attention to this stuff. <laughs>